Would you lift your voice? Let's praise him together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It is a privilege and my distinct honor to be here tonight. I planned on coming whether I was preaching or not, but it is a delight and a privilege to be asked to minister to you and a great group of people that are gathered here tonight. Amen. My heart will always be connected, significantly tied to this meeting. Four years ago, Monday night, I preached peak on a Wednesday night and my son was born three weeks early the next morning and because I had preached Wednesday night of peak I missed his birth but during that time he was in bad health and the doctor told me we're going to try something we read in a book and after that you need to find somewhere to take him and I said, Doctor, we're at the hospital. <laughs> Where else do you go for human effort? But some of you still here at Peak made prayer, and God healed my son. He's here tonight. And I am eternally thankful for this great group of people here tonight. Hallelujah. It is a delight to be here. I give honor to Brother Joel Booker, this great youth committee, great men of God in whom I have high confidence. And uh, what a great spirit is already in this place. The Holy Ghost is here. And I am thankful to be asked to be a part. I give honor to Bishop Larry Booker, the executive council of the WPF. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. And all of the ministers that are here, speakers that are coming after me, I am excited about tomorrow morning, tomorrow night, Friday morning, Friday night, hearing these great men of God preach to us. Can you say amen? amen. My wife is here. I love my wife. She's cool. I'm, I'm old enough to not be cool, but my wife is still cool. And uh, I struggle. She has more followers than I do on every social media outlet. And uh, But God is good. Amen. My kids are here. Katrin Joy, Adeline Hope, Davey Brandt. My mom's here. Grateful for that. My brother's here somewhere playing the guitar all the way from Virginia. And uh, my brother-in-law, as you mentioned, family, Sister Vondelay, sister-in-law doing a great work with the music. I'm excited. Boy, we just made it a family affair. Hallelujah. Praise God. The greatest church in Pentecost. God has allowed me to pastor Christ Temple Pentecostal Church from Gina, Louisiana. They're here. Some of them are here. A bunch of them are at home. To all my friends that text me today, here and far. Thank you for your confidence, your prayers, and I trust the Holy Ghost is going to help us tonight. My pastor is not here. He's listening online, and uh, I give honor to him. Love him very much. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 21. I do not say what I'm about to say to flatter to lift myself up um, this is not the first peak I've preached this is not the first meeting like this that I've been a part of and so in preparation prayer I had what I thought um, I wanted to do felt confident in the Holy Ghost and for the past three or four weeks five weeks the Lord has been just kind of poking me with this tonight and I said now Lord I'm preaching Wednesday night in case you don't remember <laughs> that's too high it's too too far it's too it's too big 
for Wednesday night. We need to repent. We need to get on our face. We we got to get it. We got to get the rhythm of a regular youth meeting. And God spoke to me and said, "This is not going to be a regular youth meeting." <laughs> Hallelujah. And so I'm going to follow the Holy Ghost and uh, my sweet dear wife told me this morning she said you've done good before if you mess up it'll be okay so thank you for your confidence but I feel like the Lord has spoken to me and in a few moments I'm going to be rid and loosed from this burden 2 Samuel 21 verse 20 and there was yet a battle in Gath where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes four and twenty in number and he also was born to the giant and when he defied Israel Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servant. Flip with me to Joshua chapter 11. Verse 21, at that time came Joshua and cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, from all the mountains of Judah, from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. There was none of the Anakims left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, and in Ashdod there remained. So Joshua took the whole land except for Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. I want to preach tonight with the help of the Holy Ghost and if you will help me about relentless enemies. Amen. Relentless enemies. Let's ask the Holy Ghost to help us. Would you lift your hands, lift your voice, and pray with me. God, these are your people. This is your work. This is your idea. Everything we are doing is your idea. I'm asking you, God, that you would help me anoint my mind, my mouth, my heart, my soul to follow your word, the will, and your mind tonight. God, would you meet us here? In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Would you clap your hands and shout with your voice with all of your might tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sika robo yande robo koshanda ba katayaba. Hallelujah, God. Do a work here tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God bless you for standing. You may be seated. The city of Gath. Recently excavated and studied thoroughly by a college from Palestine was perhaps the largest city-state in the biblical area in its day. The excavation showed that it was not just a town, it was not just a village, but it was indeed a large city. They said, now I don't know how they can prove it, but they said that the excavation showed that as many as 10,000 people could have inhabited Gath in the days of 2 Samuel. At that number, it would have been one of the largest cities in the area, not just in that little part of the world, but all the way stretching east, west, and south. It would have been 
a large city. It is significant that Gath is mentioned many times in the Word of God. In fact, almost everywhere that the Philistines are discussed or talked about, the city of Gath is mentioned. When David heard the news that Samuel, Saul had been killed, he says, don't let it be told in the city of Gath. Gath was a place of, of, of a, a weird history throughout the Bible. If you read throughout there, every time it is mentioned, somebody is in a struggle for territory. Somebody is in a struggle for possession. Somebody is in a struggle for things that belong to them. One mention says uh, that the people of Gath came to steal away their cattle and slew some young men. I would submit to you here tonight uh, that even in the biblical day, Gath was a stronghold of the enemy. It was significant to us uh, that in Joshua chapter 11, when God had promised to his people that he would give them the land, he would be with them. He would send his battlements and his armies with them to fight for them. The Bible tells us that he sent hornets to help them drive out the inhabitants of the land. The land in which they had been given was a place, the Bible says, that was eaten up with giants. It is talked about in Deuteronomy 2. It's talked about in Joshua 11, 14, Numbers 33. It talks about the giants that possessed the land. Not only was the land of Canaan given unto the giants, but the Bible says that as God marched Moses and Joshua and Israel around the borders, that everywhere surrounding it had been appointed unto some band of giants. The Zamims and the, uh, the Emims, which meant terror. There are all these giants that are all around the place. I would submit to you tonight that giants don't give up easily. Joshua and Caleb went into the land of promise. They did not discount the report of the other ten spies when they said, there we saw the giants. Joshua did not say, oh, they weren't giants. He did not say, no, it's just a figment of your mind. He didn't say there weren't giants, but he agreed with them readily. Yet he said, we are well able to take the land. Let's don't wait another moment. Let's don't wait another day. Let's go up this moment. Let's go up at once. Let's go up tonight. Hallelujah. Giants don't go home just because you show up. They walk through the land for 40 days. The giants and the inhabitants of the land, they knew who God was. The inhabitants of Jericho told them, we heard about you 40 years ago. And we've been wondering where you are. We've been wondering where you've been. I would submit to every pastor and to every youth pastor and to every member of every blessed congregation represented here tonight that the enemy knows that if you can get a hold of something in this meeting here tonight uh, that his stronghold uh, his foothold uh, his stranglehold on your city cannot stay it cannot remain <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> Joshua and Caleb saw the giants and when they had wandered for 40 years and they return. The Bible says that Caleb, now an old man, said the same giant 
that was here on my mountain 40 years ago is still here. I'm going to preach at peak on a Wednesday night that the same things that stopped revival 40 years ago are the same spirits that are attempting to grab a hold and suck the life out of faith the operation of the gifts of the spirit the power of the holy ghost the same spirits that blocked us 40 years ago are the same spirit Hallelujah. And so Joshua invades the land. God is with him. God works for him. And he finishes the work. And he reports back to God. There are no Anakims or giants, sons of Anak, left in the land. Except I didn't see the necessity or else I was afraid of what it would cost me with my brothers or else I was afraid of what it would cost me in the perception of my city and so I did not pursue them in Gaza in Gath or in Ashdod. I took the land. I took the whole land, God. You were with us. There were hornets working for us. There was winds working for us. The sun stood still for two days to give us victory. But I didn't believe God was big enough and strong enough and great enough to give us victory in Gath. I'm going to be very careful. But Brother Booker, had Joshua been more courageous of a leader, Samson never would have saw a harlot from Gaza. And David never would have had to kill Goliath from Gath. And there never would have been a Dagon statue for the Ark of the Covenant to be marked by if he had gone all the way when God was behind him and God was with him and God was doing miracle after miracle after miracle only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashton. Did we let it remain? And for the next several generations, the city of Gath goes back and forth between victory and defeat. In 1 Samuel 7, Samuel and the armies of the prophet subdued the Philistines. From Ekron unto Gad. But there is no mark, Brother Buxton, that anybody went in Gad. Samuel had peace for all the days that he lived, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 7 and 14. But somewhere, Gath got up. And in 1 Samuel 17, an entire nation and an entire people and an entire purpose of God's mind and will is stopped by one man from none other than Gath. When Goliath, the champion, stepped to the valley of Elah and stopped progress and stopped persistence and stopped purpose and said there'll be no Israel, there'll be no promise there'll be no performance of God's will and one young man rose from the ranks and said there is a cause greater than anything else and he slew Goliath on the battlefield and the Bible says they pursued them unto Gath but there was something about Gath that stopped them. There was something about Gath that they never crossed the gates. There was something about Gath that always
always gave them pause. Young person, I'm preaching about relentless enemies. There are things that you are going to battle that if you don't go all the way to the source, you are never going to have victory. I've come to preach on a Wednesday night of peak that we will not leave here tonight with something left in Gaza. We won't leave here tonight with something left in Gath. But I'm preaching to a generation that I wish you would rise to your feet tonight and say, Brother Wells, I want to go all the way to victory. I want to get victory over temptation. I want to get victory over fornication. I want to get victory over faithlessness. I wish I had somebody that would shout tonight. Hallelujah. Imagine with me. And I got to be careful not to preach shut up devil. But Imagine with me that moment. That Goliath hit the ground. And 80 messages of defiance are pulverized into the soul of the valley of Elah. And David pulls the sword from Goliath's sheath and cuts the head off of Goliath. And he raised that bloody stump to the people of Israel. And there was such faith and such passion and such purpose that leapt into their heart. The Bible said they pursued them unto the twilight of the next day all the way to Gath. How many times have we gotten partial victory? How many times has 90% been enough? How many times have we prayed through a few in our churches that aren't the same color as us and said, oh, thank God for revival, but we never break the back of what stopped us for years and we never choke down the spirit Come on, I wish I had somebody helping me preach. Racism is not a cultural thing. Racism is a spiritual stronghold. Racism is not a social problem. It is a spiritual problem. And we must win the fight. I wonder is there anybody that wants to go all the way? The same spirits that stopped us in the days when God was moving and people got afraid of the gifts of the Spirit and marked it as latter rain. I'm preaching to you that without the performance of miracles, signs, and wonders, we are not the apostolic church of the book of Acts. I want it all. I want it all. There's some young people tonight that say, give me the best gifts. Give me the gift of healing. Give me the gift of prophecy. Give me the gift of diverse tongues. Come on, young people. Let's go all the way to Gath tonight. Goliath dies. Yet Gath remains. And in 1 Samuel 21, David is running from Saul. The same spirits that attempt to snuff out the anointed ones. They never die. There are dream killers 
and dream squashers and dream belittlers and there will always be the relentless enemy that'll say it'll never happen there and it can't be done there but I'm going to tell you if you're a dreamer you'll help other people with their dreams Joseph was in the belly of a prison he was not ever going to get out that he knew of but everybody that had a dream he said let me help you with your dream I'll show you what it here's some money here's some prophecy I'll bless you mine's not here yet but I'll support you come on pastor in Louisiana you can throw a rock any direction from my church and hit a Pentecostal church but I'm telling you the fire hydrant mentality of 40 years ago is killing us we've got to get over it man they need the Holy Ghost they got to be saved get off it we got to have revival There's two people in your city that don't have the Holy Ghost. There's room for another church. There's room for another preacher. There's room for another anointed young person. Come on. I'm going to tell you how. And I'm off my notes for a minute, but... I'm going to tell you how we're going to have revival. When we rediscover a love for each other. Can I preach like a pastor for a few minutes? You young people can be the meanest people I've ever met. When you're 18, 19 and you're cool and that 13 year old dork that don't know how to wear his suit my God, don't make fun of him put your arm around him and say, man, I believe in you you got the Holy Ghost we're going to make it I love you you love me I need you wish we could have a commitment service that some of you 18 year old boys will make a commitment I won't put you through what I got put through as a 13 year old I'm going to pray for you I'm going to believe in you I'm going to help you preaching about relentless enemies in the day we're living we've got to have each other Being cool is killing us. When they shook cities and changed nations and closed down bars, Brother Williams, they weren't cool. They left those meetings with sawdust in their hair from rolling on the floor. They left with their minds made up that God's the greatest thing I've ever found and I'm not leaving it. Oh, I preach it on a Wednesday night. When's the last time you shouted your hair down? When's the last time you shouted your suit tie wet? I'm preaching to somebody. It's time to get over it, man. I feel my help. I'm just going to plow on for a minute. There's not a preacher in the apostolic movement that loves preacher's kids more than this one. But I'm going to help you, preacher's kids. If you'll stop waiting until Friday night when Brother Marks gets you all up here to pray you through and you'll get down here with these bunch of kids that don't know 
and shout your hair loose and shout your high heels off and forget where your hundred dollar purse is I'm telling you God will help you I'm a preacher's kid I got three of them but I'm telling you we're in this thing together we're all in the same fight there ain't nothing you're facing that the person on the pew ain't facing. There is no temptation in common man that's not all together except. We got to have each other. We need some preacher's kids and some young people that will lead in worship. Let me show you how to shout. Let me show you how to dance. Let me show you how to run the aisle. When I get to an hour, somebody raise your hand. I'm going to help you. You looking for a mate? If they look the same, leaving on Wednesday night a peak as they did coming, you don't want them. If their hair's still pretty, you don't want her, buddy. Find you one that's sweated down. That listen, she's missing some bobby pins. I'm preaching about winning the fight. If his pocket square is still in the same place after a three hour worship service, get you another one. Find you one that lost his tie. Find you one that's wiping sweat that you can see through his shirt. That's the one you want. I got to preach. First Samuel 21. You can stay where you want to. I'm a lot closer to being done than it feels like. David's running from Saul. He's anointed, scared to death because the dream killer. And the Bible said he runs into the house of God. That's a good place to go when people's trying to kill your dream. And he ate some bread. And he said, I don't have a sword, Abimelech. Right, come on. I didn't bring a sword. Yeah. I wasn't sure if they'd let me bring one in here. But... <laughs> Abimelech goes behind the ephah. Come on now. And there's this cloth. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. And he brings it out and he unwraps it. And he says, I don't have anything here, David, except the sword of Goliath, whom thou slew. You need to remember, David, you've had victory before. <laughs> you need to remember, David, that you've been in a battle before and the Lord brought you out. Remember Goliath, whom you slew. Now you got to let me preach. Are you going to leave going? I don't know what he was talking about. And I want you to watch. When he gets his hands on that sword, the Bible says there was not another one like it on the earth. Anybody know the first place he went with that sword? He went to Gath. 
and he comes bouncing into Gath with Goliath's sword strapped to his belt. There was a sword maker in Goliath. There was a sword maker in Gath that said, I recognize that sword. It's got my mark on it. That's Goliath's sword. And David said, yeah. You go ahead and sing it. I slew 10,000 of you. And I've come to tell you that God still got. And he leaves Gath. He has to act crazy to get out of there, but he gets out of there. And then there's this fuzzy time that David goes to Gath and lives there. Don't you know that was awkward? Because it don't matter how much you try. Shimei, you ain't going to fit in Gath. Hallelujah. All right. Now I'm getting ready. Now, David becomes king. He rules. He gets all kinds of victories. He gets him a name. He goes through failure. He goes through forgiveness. He goes through greatness. He begins to gather the goodness of God. But he falls into the same trap that Joshua, Samuel, Saul, he never got victory in Gath. In 1 Chronicles chapter 18, it says that David took Gath and her cities, but he did not conquer Gath. Because we skip over to my text. And Gath is still producing defiance, just like a pot belching out poison and David's tired and this is where I got to preach God please give me patience help me to pace myself to preach what you put in my spirit David's an old man now he's not he's still young enough to go to fight but he's old enough now that it takes a toll on him and he shows up at the battle and the Bible says from Gath there's a giant named Ishbi Bena. And his spear weighed 300 shekels of brass. Watch this. And he being girded with a new sword. I would submit to you tonight. I can't prove it. But I just, I know about blades. The same dude that melted and forged and hammered and twisted and pulled Goliath's sword. Maybe it was David's return trip in Verse chapter 21, when he saw it again, there's not another sword like it in the earth. But Ishbi Benob shows up at the sword maker's place and he says, I want you to make me a sword like my brother's sword or my first cousin, depending on which commentary you read. <laughs> I about said something bad there. My brother or my first cousin. <laughs> Ain't sure. <laughs> but we're in Oklahoma. We ain't somewhere east of here. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
That don't happen in Oklahoma. And so he, he gets this. I done messed up now. <laughs> I'm going to have to preach my way out of this one. Ain't I? That's all right. He goes into this sword maker. And he says, I want you to make me a sword. I don't know how long it took. Probably many weeks, many months. Many try-ons and try-outs and feeling and cutting and sharpening and twisting. And no, the balance isn't right. There's too much weight in the hilt. There's too much weight in the tip. Bring it down a little bit. It's in, and he, maybe he pulls it up. And he hangs up a, a, a pig or something. And he, and he says, well, it's not right yet. Put a little more here. Take a little off here. Get the edge right. And finally it gets right, Brother Buxton. And he puts it on. And he says, I'm going to fight. And I'm going somewhere that Goliaths and giants and Anakims always go. I'm going to find me some anointed people. I'm going to find me some God-called people. And I'm going to kill me a preacher. Oh, I'm about to preach a pain off of these walls in here. He said, I'm going to kill him. I didn't get him way back then. And Goliath couldn't kill him when he was young. But he's older now. And there's times past. I'm going to kill J. I didn't get apostolic truth back in the latter rain. I didn't kill it back in the day. But it's tired now. It's old now. The preachers are tired. The preachers are all old. It'll be... Give us another generation and we'll get holiness preaching out of their pulpit. Give us another generation and we'll get conviction out of their prayer rooms. Give us another generation. There were some young people. Oh. God help. There were some young people, Brother Booker. They didn't want to go sow their wild oats. They didn't want to go mess up and come back. They wanted to sit around David's campfire and say, tell us about that sword. Tell us about the day when you picked up those stones at the bottom of the brook, Kidron. Tell us about the day when it flew straight and true. Tell us about the day when the Lord brought the victory. Tell us about... God. And I'm going to pick on you, Brother Booker, but I feel like there's a reason you love David so much. I feel like I, I don't think he was as big as you, but I think he had the same kind of spirit. And I like to get Brother Booker somewhere and just talk to him. Just I try. I don't like being around him when he's tired because he don't like to talk. Tell us a story. Tell us about this. Tell us about that. And I can see those firelit nights. And there's a group of men in that soldier's army. They wasn't off somewhere worshiping idols. They wasn't off somewhere giving their whole life to the pursuit of something that was passing and... They weren't off somewhere giving all their effort and energy to something that wasn't going to count. They were sitting around David saying, tell us, tell us, tell us how you brought the ark home. Tell us how God blessed you. Tell us the due order. (laughs) How do I get one of those swords? How do I get a ministry like yours? How do I get an anointing like Verbal Bean? How do I get an anointing? And I'm just a country boy at heart. In fact, I'm a country boy all the way through. (laughs) Not just in my heart. My wife put a lot of polish on me. So I'd look right up here. (laughs) But if you know anything about me, if you come to my house and you stay long enough, (sighs) we're going to start looking at stuff. We're going to look at all the guns. 
First, we, we always start with knives, though. We pull them out. And I'm not like a lot of pastors. How many of you have been in a pastor's office that got those swords? You know what I'm talking about? When I was evangelizing, I tried everybody's. Ain't none of you got one. Ain't a single one of you got one. Every sword that's in those offices, they're for display only. They're not even real swords. You can't cut butter with them. They don't have an edge. Go in your pastor's office Sunday, find his sword and try. You can't even cut yourself. You better not try that in my office. Because my sword will cut your arm off. In fact, you can shave with my sword. Every pastor up here is going home to buy a sharp sword. Why would you want a sword that doesn't have an edge? That's the problem with our generation. That's the problem with our place. That's the problem with what our sword doesn't have an edge. Preach it, man. Preach it till it cuts. Preach it till it slices. Preach it till it saws out. Put a sword. Come on, preacher. Preach it till it cuts away sin. Preach it till it cuts away decisions. Preach it till there's nothing left but conviction. I don't want to display sword. I want a sword you got to be careful with. I want a sword that'll cut going and coming. Somebody come, give them hope. And I can see it. How long I've been preaching? Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. Just wait a minute. And I can see them. They're sitting around the fire. And David, he's like Brother Booker. When he gets just in the right mood, I can see David. Maybe he slips into his tent. And he comes back with a little leather bag. And a, and a long cloth wrapped object and he sits down around the fire and he opens the sword of Goliath and he pulls it from his sheath and he said there was not a greater victory in my life than that day in the valley of Elah and he opens the bag and there's five stones and one of them's blood stained and he said boys these things still work Apostolic preaching still works. Repentance still works. Holiness preaching still works. You don't have to get a smoke in some mirrors. You don't have to find a new way. Get a sword, young man, and start preaching the doctrine, the holiness, the life of the gospel. And I don't know how many times he showed them that sword. And I don't know how many times he shows them those stones. But I pray tonight, and if the Lord spoke to me, it is going to happen. The Bible says David went to battle. He's older now. Ishmael Benob shows up and he says, I'm going to kill David. I'm going to kill him today. And the Bible says that David waxed faint. I know, young men, young women, I know you know how to do what you're told. I know you love to hear us preach on holiness. But do you know why? 
we're preaching holiness. I know you know how to shout, but do you know why you got to shout? Have you caught the purpose and the cause? Have you find the best? Have you fought the same spirit that rose in David when Goliath was there? Something's got to be done. Somebody's got to fight. Somebody's got to preach. Somebody's got to be convicted. And I see, I'm not... I'm not trying to line my pockets for the accolades of elders tonight. But the reason we're here tonight is because there were some Davids that said there's a cause that's greater than my own ministry. There's a cause that's greater than my own happiness. And they endured to... They endured hardship. They lost friendships. They severed ties because there was a purpose that was higher. But I wonder on this Wednesday night a peak, do you know why that sacrifice was worth it? Do you know why it was necessary? Is there anybody here tonight that knows the reason for the call? You can pray all night when your pastor tells you to, but do you ever feel the urge to do it on your own? You know how to preach one God, but can you get up anywhere and wake up in the middle of the night and preach the doctrine, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you know there's only one name given whereby we must be saved? Do you know why? You gotta be holy, separated, and clean. I know that when the old man says, go kill those Philistines, you can go kill them. But I want to ask you a more searching question. Can you identify Philistines? Do you know what they look like? Do you know what they smell like? Do you know what idolatry feels like? Do you know what it looks like? Can you stand when it's in its infancy? I'd say, my dad. Jonah Dab. The Rechabite preached to his kids, don't drink wine, don't live in houses. Why did he say that? Because if you flip your Bible back to the book of Kings, you'll see a young man named Jehonadab that Jehu comes riding from Samaria. And he says, is your heart right, young man? He said, it is. He said, well, get in here with me. We're going to kill some Baal worshipers. I'm in the book. Jehu called a meeting of all the Baal worshipers in the world. They all came to his ivory temple at Samaria that Ahab built. He locked the doors and he told Jonadab, you walk through and make sure there's nobody in there except worshipers of Baal. Brother Calhoun, the Bible said that young man's heart was right. And he walked he walked pew to pew throughout Ahab's ivory temple and he said "Mm -hmm. that's what idolatry looks like that's what idol worship looks like that's what Baal worship looks like if you can and the Bible said Jehu and Jonadab shut the doors on that temple and they turned it into a septic tank 
But when he walked out of that temple, his heart was right. He knew what idolatry looked like. And he told his kids, drink no wine forever. I'm preaching to a generation. You may not know why, but there were some men. They knew what idol worship looked like. Their heart was right. And they said, don't get on TV. Don't look at it. Don't watch it. Don't have it in your house. Don't play sports. That's idolatry. Do you know what it looks like? messed up my message but I'm finishing David's tired I see an old preacher is there any young men gonna get it oh they're good boys they know how to go to fight when I tell them to but Am I always going to have to lead them into the battle? But what happened on this day is what I pray happens tonight. Step out, Brother Booker. I know it's kind of hard right there. It's kind of hard to figure a giant beating this guy up. But the Bible said David wax faint. He's fighting. They should be beaten up. Ishbi benam has got a new sword. It's just like his brother's Goliath. He's fighting David. He's got his purpose made up. I'm going to kill him. He's a relentless enemy. He's been waiting on this for a generation. He's been waiting on this for 40 years. He's fighting. He's fighting. He's fighting. I need a young man whose heart's right. Is your heart right? Is your heart like right mine? Grab my hand. Leap up here. Hold on, Abba Hashatokaya. Is your heart right? The Bible said Ishbi Benob's coming. But the Bible said there was a young man by the name of Abishai. He recognized the sword of Baba Kasotokia in Ishbi Benob's hand. And something rose up in him. And the Bible said he ran. arms out and the Bible said he secured him he got in between him and his people knob and something rose in that young man and he slew that giant Come on, somebody pray in the Holy Ghost. Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Here we go. And when Ishbi Benob hit the ground, you're just going to have to trust me. Abishai reached over and he picked up the sword of Ishbi Benob and he turned to David and he said, David, as long as I'm living, you don't have to go out again because the light is going to keep burning. I got a sword, David. I'll fight for truth. I'll fight for holiness. I'll die for righteousness. I'll die for godliness. I'm preaching. Come on, Abishai. Where are you? Where are you? Come on. Do you know why your pastor preaches it? Do you know why he says it? Get you a song.
stay with me. God's not finished, I promise. But giants are relentless. And they go home. And David has not need to go back out anymore. But you read it like this. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. And Sibachai, the Hushathite, slew Sath, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was yet a battle again at Cobb with the Philistines, where Elhanan, the son of Jeroragam, a Bethlehemite, who slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. But here we are. And this is where we're going. Every generation prior to that one had done exactly what they had done. They fought just my God have mercy. They fought giants when they showed up. They fought giants when they stood on the mountains that belonged to Judah. They stood against giants when they came into the fields and the fields of lentils. But there is no record in your Bible previous to this moment. And there is no record of it afterwards that anybody ever fought a giant in Gath. They just waited on every generation to kill the burping, belching spit of gas. But I pray this is the generation to who I'm preaching to tonight. That with faith rising in their spirits, they banded together and they said one to another, let's don't wait until the battle comes to our house. Let's don't wait until the next giant tells us we can't have revival. Let's don't wait until the next giant defies our pastor. Let's go to death. Let's have revival where they couldn't have it in the 60s. Let's have revival where they wouldn't have it in the 40s. Let's go to death. Come on, Sibakai. Come on, get up here, Sibakai. Come on, get up here. Get over there by Abishai. Come on, El Hannon. Come on, Jonathan. A Bethlehemite. I'm in the book. The Bible said these four dudes, they're, they're giant killers. Oh, Abishai shows them his sword every time he gets a chance. And something rose up in them. And I can see them, they sit around a couple of weeks waiting on some Philistines. Maybe they got them a camp at Gob. They're waiting. This is where you, this is where you giants like to fight. Come on. But giants know how to wait. But I'm preaching to a generation that ain't got no thought of waiting. preach way too long but I'm going to finish preaching I hear the cautious hesitation of the dream killers 
Don't go to Gath, boys. There's freaks down there. They got six fingers and six toes. It ain't no giants like you've ever dealt with. You start busting, you start busting into that neighborhood, and you're gonna get some stuff you ain't never had in this pretty little church. I tell you what, I hope, I hope a crackhead sits by you Sunday morning and gets the Holy Ghost. Somebody feeding on meth sits down beside you and your preacher preaches them to the altar and some of these young people lay hands on them and they get the Holy Ghost. Let's go to God. Well, we tried that 20 years ago and we lost some of you. We tried that and we lost. I'm preaching to some people. Let's go to God. Come on, boy. Come on. I promise I'm finished. I see him walking through the streets of Gath. Come on, boy. Y'all know where the giants are? They walk into that side of town that their cute little church ain't never knocked doors in. Hey, there are any giants here? There are any victories here? There are any revivals here? And I love this. I wish, if, I wish I was good enough of a preacher to preach it like it really happened. But they find this big old door. The excavators of Gath said it was the largest set of gates they had ever seen of any of the studies they had ever done. And I see those band of Israelites walk through the gates of Gath. They weren't afraid. Joshua and Caleb's generation said we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. So we were in theirs. Not these boys. We're looking for a giant. This looks like a big enough door for a giant. Somebody knock on that door. Hey, wake up, giant. We're here to kill you. Wake up, giant. We're here to shut you up. Wake up. And the door creaks open. And there's the daddy of all of them. The grandpa or the dad of all the giants. He's got six fingers on every hand. Six toes on every foot. And he's standing there. And he says, who are you boys? Which one of you is Jonathan? There's Jonathan. He looked him right in the eye. And he said, are you an Anakim? He didn't tell him who he was. He didn't tell him where he came from. He wanted to know one thing. Are you a giant? Are you a giant? Yeah, say it like you mean it. Are you a giant? Yeah, say it again. Are you a giant? giants can't help their self it's just in their nature the bible says watch it when he defied israel there was no fight there was no struggle there was no the bible said the moment it got out of his mouth jonathan slew him just needed to know if you were a giant and the moment he opened his mouth the Bible said he slew him he didn't struggle with him he didn't fight 
destroyed him. He killed him. And the Bible says these four were born to the giant at Gath. And these four die by the hands of David's young men. And the light is still burning. And you can start in the next chapter. And you can read all the way to Revelation 22. And you find enemies. And you find oppressors. And you find adversaries. But you can read every cover. You can break down every word. You can read it in the Hebrew, the Greek, whatever you want to read it. And I'm going to tell you what you don't ever find again in the entire Bible is an Anakin. Jonathan said, I'm tired of every generation having to kill a giant. I'm tired of every generation having to deal with gas. Let's go to gas and get it over with. You know what your church needs? But if we had Sister Vondelay, if we had all that singing and music, if we had a preacher like Brother Jackson, if we had a pastor like Brother Urshan, we could have revival. No, 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 no. All your church needs is for you to get anointed. It's for some of you to bind together and say, I'm not going to leave it up to pastor. I'm going to get in front of him. I'm going to shroud him. I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to work. I'm going to preach. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. Oh, let's go to God. So here's what we're going to do. I'm looking for you, Abishai. I'm looking for you, Elhanan. Where are you, Sivakai? Are you ready to get anointed? Where are you, Jonathan? Are you through playing with the world? Are you through messing around? Come on. We need some giant killers. We need some men of war that'll understand the reason we're fighting. So here's what's going to happen tonight. Your pastor's waiting on you to get it. Don't make your pastor worry about how you're going to be living next week. Let's go to Gath and kill it. You got relentless enemies. Let's get victory over them tonight and make up our minds. Never again, giant. Never again, giant. Never again. You're not going to defy me. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to hinder me. We're going to have revival. Hallelujah. So if you're here tonight, and you're ready to get anointed, the Holy Ghost sent me word, plan on being there a while tonight. So if you're ready to go eat, go ahead. And if you're ready to go play, go ahead. 
But if you're here tonight, I'm not, I'm not kidding. If you don't care about praying, you're dismissed. Give us some room. But if you're here tonight and you're ready to make up your mind, I want to be anointed. I want to be a soul winner. I want to be a prayer warrior. I want to be gifted. I want to have the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I want to lay hands on the sick and they recover. I want to preach and people get the Holy Ghost. I want to see and chains be broken. I want to pray and walls fall down. I want you to come as close as you can. I want every pastor and every evangelist to make a commitment to me right now. I want you not to leave until you put your hand on the head of some young person and pray God would anoint them like he never has before. Don't just pray for your church. Pray for somebody else's church. We need some Jonathans tonight. We need some El Hennens. Come on. Where are you? Let's go to Gath. Let's go to Gath. Let's go to Gath. Come on, it's time to get anointed. Come on, El Hennon. Come on, Jonathan. Let's go to Yeah. Come on, get a sword. Get a sword. Come on, man of God. Come on, man of God. Pray with us. Come help us. Come help us. Come help us. Come on, Jonathan. Come on, young lady. It's time to get anointed. Come on, young preacher. Come on, young preacher. Will the light. Come on. Let's go to Gap. Let's go to Gap. Let's have revival where they never had revival. Let's have prayer. 